Hi, I'm Brent Johnson, and today I'm still at the Shrine of St. Joseph in St. Louis, Missouri, where Chris Soar and Richard Nickerson have been very busy working on re-leathering the large reservoir of this 1890 J.G. Pfeffer organ here behind me. If you missed the first video, you can find a link right up here, or there's a link down in the description. Now, they've gotten all of the parts out and cleaned up, and it's time to start prepping all of the wood to be attached back together with glue. One of the first steps was determining how much the wood of the reservoir might have changed shape over the last 130 years, and if the ribs that they found on the instrument needed to be modified to work properly. So when we were working, we found that the ribs um, of the reservoir were bowed, cupped, and um, the wrong lengths, <laughs> or the wrong depth, I guess. Yeah, yeah, actually, they should, the original reservoir probably had a lot wider yeah. ribs. Yeah. So we ended up having to do a little bit of planing to make the, them all line up properly. And um, when we started putting it back together, we had to um, really pay attention, and this is where it was very handy to have somebody else who knows how to work on larger reservoirs and do this kind of work, instead of just having somebody to be hands, is to have somebody who can have the eye and to, to have the instinct. Because when we start moving, you move one side, it's going to move the other side, and then you just play a comedy of, of errors through that. So we had to watch that and be very careful. We're changing the width of the ribs at the top, so it will line up in the normal place on the top, and when we put it back in, the bottom rib will line up, the, line up at the normal place on the base. And so why wouldn't you trim both of them? Because that will move everything. We only need to move one. Okay. Okay. So if... Uh, and that doesn't throw off the mechanics of the whole thing. Oh, no. That makes it fold easily and not bind when it's closed. Okay. When it's draw. open, it'll work either way. Okay. It's but just the it's, closing when process. it closes, if you don't have them closing together. in the same place, yeah. it just starts to tear it apart. Same but area. What if they did that already to the ribs? So we need to measure those, right? We need to measure the ribs. Okay. So yes. that's the step that I've been missing in this and going, yeah. why are we just doing it without knowing that they haven't already been shortened? We're making a, an initial assumption that the ribs are the same width. Gotcha. Okay. So we need to check that. Chances are, based on what I saw in the ribs, the way they were made and everything else, they no, didn't that, do that. Yeah, no, I would. Exactly four and seven eight. So there's been no modification done to these. So we have to put these together. This is the top, this is the outside edge. I don't want to cut it off the inside edge. Okay. Can we do the other one? Make sure we're far enough out so you don't catch the edge of the, <laughs> the frame. Okay, good. Now we got good support on this, so this isn't a uh, problem. If that's, cut, if that's cutting good and not grabbing, you could probably in increase the the. Uh, I think it's. <laughs> Beautiful. You know? Look at these tiny little curls, they're so cute. <laughs> I, I spat on this and then I essentially roll the plane as I'm doing it. So I'm taking pieces off of uh, all the way over, so I'm making a curved edge. Get some of it off. See how much more.
Or are you just hitting that top line? Yeah, I'm just hitting the transition to this. That's my line for the tape. Mm -hmm. And then we can size this paint line. And then just enough to see to put the tape on. Mm -hmm. OK? And when you get the material glued on, you pull the tape off, you don't see the line because it's right at or under the edge. That makes sense. When we put the leather on the outside of this, we don't butt these things together tight to put the leather down. We, we leave a space like that, which is equal to twice the thickness of the piece of leather that's on here, so that when it folds, the hinge point won't be inside. It'll be right at the edge where it needs to be. And then your outer piece of leather hinges at the same point. And uh, those are the kind of things that people make mistakes, they glue it on like that, and then they have a real problem because they have a lot of glue build up on the other side when they put the other hinge on it and it makes noises. And that was the space so that this piece of leather when it's folded would be equal to this space. And of course this is not flat, it's springing up a little bit, so it's changing things a little bit. That's nothing. At least it's set. We got our center lines, you know, so that we can keep it lined up. And then when we bring it over here to actually glue stuff, we'll weight it as needed to keep the middle together and flat. And then, uh, for some of these boards, they're actually curved this way. So when the space is right here and down there, it's too close here. So when we're putting this together, I'll put a wedge in there and space it out like it is at the end so it's a straight shot. And you see how big it gets in the middle. But when we're starting this, we'll have it clamped. So then we can do this. See? And, but this sets the parameters for how we start. And we, especially on this thing here, we can just put these boards over and clamp them to the frame and then do whatever we need to do in the middle to make that close up like it should be. And of course, as soon as it's dry and we fold it, it won't be a problem because it flexes this way. The wood, the wood uh, separated here and chunks came up, so I glued them back down. And we did that with white glue. And I'm going to sand it off so that the surface is clean, so that the fish glue will stick to it. Okay, and this is all going to be back. That's just to make the, the thing all the same like it was. Feels pretty flexible. Ooh. One random screw. Two random screw. All right. You kind of get that corner sort of, and I get this corner sort of. Oh, look. It's popping, isn't it? Look. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's a old one. So wanted you to help. Ooh, joint. Yeah, see how close those. That grill is how close together they are. Yeah, that's Kilgan. real close. Kilgan did it this way too. Is that wood or metal? Yeah, it's it's wood. Yeah, this is. Uh... Now you remember which end went where? What? You marked it, right? I did. I'll mark it even more for you with your sharpie. If that's what you would prefer. No, 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 as long as you have it marked. Okay. This hasn't been scraped or water treated or anything, but. You may be pretty good. Should yeah. I just run it over with the sand I would just think of check it over. Yeah, look at that. Nice and clean. That's what it says in the small print, right? Nice and clean? Yeah. What hotel have you been staying at? Oh, that's good. As usual, the rubber cloth is a little bit distorted. Why as usual? What, what happens when well, it gets, you know, it gets folded and stretched and sometimes it's... Uh, just gets a little distorted. Is that uh, from manufacturer or is that from like me storing it? Probably from you storing it. Seriously? Yeah. Okay. So what do I need to do to change that? Well, when you roll it up this way, if you roll a piece of paper in it, you tuck it in and you roll it tight. And what you do when you roll it, you don't just roll it up. 
you lay it down with the paper in it and it's rolled and you keep rolling it four or five times and it causes this to all flatten out nice. Now well, this one here, you see this this end goes out that way a little bit, it won't balance. The rubber cloth used to attach the ribs to the lid and to the reservoir only needs to be cut into a thin strip. However, those strips have to go all the way around the reservoir twice, once above and once below. All of that material needs to be cut to width by hand for a total amount of material that will attach all eight ribs. There's the backbone right there. When you're cutting gussets, it's good not to have it go over the backbone if you can help it. It's really hard to sometimes stretch it and make it work. Ooh, hear that? It's, it's uh, a little dry in here, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. That's right. I love you anyway. This, this has uh, a slight imperfection in it. <laughs> Small hole to work with, but this is nothing. Some of the leather strips, of course, uh, they don't have cows that are ten and a half feet long. So the leather we had, we had to cut to the size needed for the hinging. And then we had to end lap it. We skived it and end lapped it. And we used white glue only for that joint because that wasn't stuck directly to the reservoir. But it allowed us to stick those strips on with fish glue and not dissolve and soften the joint we made to make long enough strips to use. In that case, it was an advantage, but we did not use it in a place that was structural. Usually I try to get two pieces that are the same, and uh, then one of the tricks, of course, is to you put the two pieces together, and uh, hopefully this works. Uh, same width. You can do it at an angle if you want, straight across, doesn't make any difference. But for this particular case, I'm going to do it straight. I cut through both pieces. Okay. Now you'll have matching joint. In other words, when you go to put it together, one piece isn't going to be like that, and the other one taken off like this. They're kind of in line. And you can do, do the same thing if you want to do an angle, because if you've got a bunch of leather that has angles on the end, you can lay them on top of each other, make a straight cut through so the angles match, and when you flip them around like this, they'll perfectly match. And then uh, on one of these, you skive it this way. Okay. And you get it as much as you want. And on this one, you do it on the face side. This is the back, this is the face, okay? And leather is stretchy, so it doesn't always work perfect the first time. But, do something like that. Okay. Then you take this one. Put it on top of that one. I can't see because of the lights in the wrong place. But you do something like that, okay? So I'll uh, do this one, just one, to start. Here's a piece of tape, and I put it right on this edge, right where the bevel starts, okay? And I just tape it down. Then I'll take that big bucket of like blue. Nope, too much. Okay. 
you prefer doing it with metal or or are you just using your knife because it's handy? Uh, I'm using the knife because it's handy. You see, now I get the glue up on top of the tape, it doesn't matter. Right. And then, uh, yeah. As every guy knows, that's what jeans are for. Wiping off glue, your fingers after you eat, blood when you cut your finger, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so I've got that, so the cut edge of this is pretty much lined up with that piece of tape. Okay, and it doesn't have to be exactly perfect. Now sometimes when you're putting things down like this, even though they were the same size to start with, It'll be a little tiny bit different, but you can always trim the difference off afterwards. Mm -hmm. And usually what I do is I just let that sit. I, I'm also curious as to why the skive isn't broader, so you have more surface area to glue to. You don't need you don't, to. You don't need to. Once it's stuck, it's stuck. It's stuck, yeah. Because that's not doing anything mechanically. It's no. It's just for visual. It's it's to keep it even and, and not have edges and not... I've seen many of those where they just overlap a piece of leather like this. Okay. To me, that doesn't look very nice. So you don't have to do a broad sky, just a... No, a you could do a broad sky if you want, but that's more surface to glue. Yeah. And it and doesn't, it doesn't add like, anything. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. In fact, it might make the leather stiffer whenever you try gluing it down. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Let me close this. Well, back. that's a handy trick. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to do it a lot. Yeah, we are. Okay. Yeah. So now you're going to do this one on an angle versus being straight. Yeah, just, just to be different. Yep. Okay. But you see, I got both sides. When you do that, you have to have both surfaces that are alike up, whether it's the face or, or the underside. Mm -hmm. And then you turn it around. When you turn it around, you see you have a perfect match, and the piece of material will continue straight. Yep. It's not skewed. Looks beautiful. Okay. So I match that up. I just pull it back there and go like that. Sometimes you don't get it all in one, one bite. So. Well, this one is the one you do on the face. You just try to make the bevel about equal. You probably get a lot of comments about how to do this. I only do that to hold one piece in place and to right. prevent the glue from getting smeared all over the face of the leather. Which is smart. Yeah. And it's right at the edge of the bevel, so it'll be a real clean. Yeah. Yeah. And it's white glue, so you won't see it. Right. If you use something else, of course, uh, another kind of glue like yellow wood glue or yeah, anything else, see you'd that. see it. If I need a little more, I can go get some more. Mm -hmm. well, I'm pushing it a little bit, time-wise, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to do that so this has a chance Surface. to dry, mm -hmm. and once that's dry, then you peel the piece of tape off from this side to this side. You don't like peel it off mm -hmm. because uh, you, you don't want Bend it to it. yank on the joint. Mm -hmm. But I'll just let that sit there, and that'll dry in a few minutes, and done. If you glued this together using the same adhesive of fish glue that you're going to glue the leather down with, when you're gluing that down, it could soften and separate the joint you made. So by using white glue, once it's dry, it won't soften up in the length of time that you will be gluing it down with the fish glue onto the wood. So the joint, this joint will stay solid during the whole time that you're actually gluing the pieces of leather down onto the edge.
still have to tape this one. The only reason I'm doing one side and drying it and then doing the other side is so when we stick the bricks on it, we don't glue the bricks to the, to the glue. Yeah. I know that one of the things that I like to do that I've learned over the years by making my own mistakes and not doing it um, is to use a watered down solution of the glue that you are going to use to do all of your gluing and you size all of the parts with that and it acts pretty much like um, primer paint does to paint. And uh, as you know, that you know, if you don't use primer and you paint your house with it, without it, it the paint peels. But uh, in this case, the wood is so old and so dry, and the air is so dry that we want to make a good sticky bonding surface. So we put the full strength glue on it, it would stick. And since this extra water in that sizing glue, we would paint all of the surfaces we we're going to glue to. And we would go all the way around the reservoir in one operation. By the time we got to where we started, it was bone dry because it's so dry in here. Even the glue, when we used it, it's fairly thick. We had to cut it a little bit with water to keep it workable while we were doing it. And we'd get through with one operation and the glue container is open. We would have to add some more water because so much had extracted by the dryness that, that it was getting too thick again. Here's a nearly complete pair of ribs. The outer leather has been attached, the sizing has been applied, and they're ready to receive the interior hinge material. It's now time to start attaching the rubber cloth to the lid of the reservoir. As soon as we start, we can't stop, you know. Yep. I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. Good enough for you? I don't know. I can't see it. You know, if I see some stuff, I need you to You see dry spots? Yeah, I do too. Okay, that'll do. This. Okay. But okay. We're good to go. Okay. Alright, so you wanna do it like I did? Yep. I put the leather over there, but when I'm starting to glue down, I just take some of it over here. Okay. Make sure that if you go like in this particular case, I would suggest you do like this much at a time. Okay. okay. I was going to do shorter, so that's Okay, fine. go ahead, do that. I glued to see how well it's bonding. Also I can pull it back this way and see if the, the wood and the fabric is still wet with glue. If you pull it back and the fabric looks like it's dry, then there's not enough glue. Make adjustments to your application so that you, you make sure. You've got to put a fair amount of glue down because a lot of the uh, glue and the moisture gets sucked up into the fabric. I'm laying down the glue. I'm trying to avoid the edge as much as I can. You can see there's nothing out here. That's the way I want it. Do is I take a rag, damp rag, and just run it along like that, support it with my fingernail to take off the excess. And since this glue has a fairly long open time, I can glue a bunch of this, clean it off, and not have to worry at all about the glue drying to the point where it won't stick.
I'm going to size it this Pretty way. Pretty close to flat. Well, it's 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 not going to run that way. Well, yeah. When we glue the material on, we'll fold it back up like it was, so it's in the right position. But this is this is just uh, sizing. Is the first set of ribs we glued up with the interior hinge. The exterior hinge, right there, was done yesterday, and this is how easy it. Flexes. There's no resistance to it, and nothing. It's very flexible. Here's a time lapse of finishing the interior hinges of all the ribs. positions they belong in based on the numbers we put on them so we will put them exactly in the same position they were when we took them apart and we're going to space out the space between each rib set of ribs at each corner and we'll keep fussing with it until we get it exactly so that all those spaces are equal so one pattern for a gusset will fit for all four corners and we put them right in the position they're going to be when we actually glue the hinging on. Okay, so that should have a C and that should mark a match in here. So I mark them on an end rather than the middle so the orientation endwise is always able to be reproduced. Now I've got the point that exists at the bottom roughly even with the inside edge of the material. How close is that one? About an inch three quarters. Oh, it's half, I've got it right in line with this. You see, this point is a little short. So, that, if I split the difference between where the edge of that piece of material and the other one is, then that's a start point. And then uh, we'll do from the end of the point all the way around on all of them, just to get it set at a start point for doing our settings. This point is where I started. But I usually start it by setting the point distance on both ends of the given rib from here to there. Okay, That's just a start point. Because sometimes these points are different, some of them are pointed. Like even on this one here, you see a piece of the point is gone. So if we were using this side, it would throw everything off. Mm -hmm. So that's why I do my measurements for spacing off of the angle for the gusset, not the points of the ribs, because they can be very different. Like this one here, the bottom point is short. This one is longer. So you go off of this edge. So now we gotta put that one in. Okay, so this one should be B, and it is. Okay, now, the way this is gonna work, when this is in position, this will fold up over there and glue on, just like we planked. And see, this one is, is off also because uh, uh, this point is a little different. But it's, it's not a big deal. Okay, so I'm just gonna just do that. That's roughly to the point. So I'll check this one. Oh, almost exactly the same. Good. Okay, so that's a start. Now this one here. That's pretty close to that same measurement. It's also real close. That's good. Now this one, in theory, has to go that way. Okay. And you see this is different because that rib is longer. See that's off by probably three-eighths of an inch. So I'm going to pull this back about half of that distance and reset this. Something like that. Let's see if that's even. That's pretty close. Okay, good. That's pretty close to the point. And that's see way that's off. way off. See? So you take half of that distance, divide it in half, and I'm gonna reset this thing so that it 
it's actually roughly at that point. And then I check the other side. Okay, that's just about the same. But then a thickness of a piece of thin cardboard. Alright, so the next thing I do is I put weights on the ribs near the end, but not in the way of doing my measurements. And the reason for that is we're going to be sliding these in and out to get the, the overlap of the fabric exactly where it's going to be when it's glued in. You do that all the way around and then you measure this space on each of the corners. So now we have a rough setting for the centering of each set of ribs on the frame. Now we have to set this dimension and the way I do that is I roll the fabric up over the edge where it's going to get glued and I make the edge of the fabric flush with the with the edge of the frame. And I do the same here. See. And just to show you as an exaggerated point, see I've got that too far in now, you see? When the fabric starts to fold way out there, you can see it. So you move it out, usually I have it out and I put the fabric up and I push with my thumb until it goes to the right point. Just let this slide in. But I don't change this dimension. But I do that on all four sets of ribs. All the way around. Now, this was just glued, so I gotta be really cautious on this one. That's good. Now I'll go down to the other end. See, that's too far in, so. There we go. Okay, that's that. Now I'm going to do that one. Okay. That's okay. I usually go around a second time. Just to make sure if I made an adjustment one place or the other, I didn't shift anything. This happens a lot quicker on a smaller reservoir. This one here, you have to consider mileage. Started from one end, and then uh, we would spread the glue on the wood and then we would spread a thinner layer of glue on the back side of the fabric and then fold it up and work it a little bit and because it's so dry and everything here within you know a minute or two it was sticking on its own then we would stick a piece of tape on it like this okay and make sure that's stuck on good like this and that of course puts the fabric in and then we would literally do this and pull, roll, make sure this was pulled up tight so it's tight to the where it needs to be and we just stuck it on. Once the ribs have been attached to the lid with rubber cloth, the process of preparing them and the lid to be attached to the reservoir and for the final leather to be glued on continues. This involves taping off the glue area and sizing the wood. Meanwhile, Chris tackled a couple of other necessary tasks. The leather that covers the feeder check valves needed to be replaced. Now, this is material that keeps the air pumped into the reservoir from flowing back out into the feeders. It's worth noting that the church opted not to re-leather the feeder bellows as part of this project. Also, the stiffener boards, the long pieces of wood that were added at some point to reinforce the lid, needed to be reattached. Now, they had been screwed on from the inside previously in a fairly precarious manner, so Chris is taking the time to drill pilot holes and attach the stiffeners from the outside so that the screws are going through the entire thickness of the lid and well into the stiffener wood.
Next, work begins on the reservoir box to prepare it to receive the lid again. We cut uh, enough of it already when we had the, the full width of this to work with. So we cut all the strips we needed to do this. And uh, that's all the rubber cloth we need for the rest of the organ. And uh, so I'm just sizing this ready. I still have to mark this edge for when the leather goes around. And uh, on this, what I used was the underside as a reference point to run my square. On this side, I won't be able to do that for all of it, so I'm gonna, actually before the rubber cloth goes on, I'm gonna run the square off of this edge and down to where the leather is going to end up. It looks like we're gonna be able to put the leather right back onto where it was. Normally there would be more overlap on the box, but this one is built a little differently and the ribs are a little different, so I'm gonna put it back right where it was. Besides this last night, but it's still wicking in pretty good. Climbing it up to the tape edge, that's where it has to be good and look good and everything. Yeah, but you're starting at the top. Yeah, and I or on the rib. Go along here. And then I just do this. Yeah. And you see the tape is below where the glue ended, but it's better to not have the tape underneath. So I've had reservoirs in years past that um, had a problem with the glue bubbling after I glued something down. And that was before the days when I used to make a habit of always sizing. And then uh, I had to essentially work out a way to clamp it, keep it clamped while the glue set so that that wouldn't happen. It was just the air coming out of the wood. So I, I modified how I did it based on suggestions from other people in the trade. And uh, I their suggestions so what I was doing it made the job better. Yeah, this this uh, part of the the frame here is is end grain and it doesn't shrink end grain it shrinks sideways and this is side grain so it's the part of the frame there this has shrunk so that you get this little difference in the in the uh, length of this this hasn't changed but this has that's why there's that little step and there's another one over there you can see it that uh, and it'll be the same on the other end and we could shave this off but it's really not needed
I like doing this now because it's what I had to do upside down once this is in place. And I guess this will go right over this. So it'll be uh, well covered and glued and everything else. So. Now when he's done with this, the following first thing we'll trim it. But, uh, you can grip it hard if this is crushed. The lid is ready to return to its position on the reservoir. This is a job that required some extra hands, so Zach Simon has arrived to help with this step. The ribs have been set in the closed position and then taped up so they would stay there. And for reasons I'm not entirely sure of, the only footage we have of this step is this time-lapse video of them bringing it into position. It looks easy when you do it at that speed. The tape was removed and the next step was placing the lid accurately on the box. All right, see so the space here. So mm -hmm. over here when it's flush, there's not much of a space. So what we have to do is when that touches, have the space here the same as it is over here. Okay. Yeah. Try not to get on a high spot. It looks like approximately an eighth of an inch. That looks very similar, doesn't it? Okay. That's our cut. We mark the end of the point so that when we have this up and we're nailing it, we don't have to remeasure everything again. This is a quarter on this side. Okay. It's an eighth on the other side, okay, though. Okay. Um, shall we take it that direction? Yeah, you have a quarter on that side yeah, and you have it. an eighth here. Take it's it, it my direction. Here. Yeah. Ready? Whoop. It's a little much. Okay. I'd say that's good. That's splitting the hair on that. And no, never mind the end. We'll do that next. Yeah. Oh, we should do it. We should, we should get. Uh, one, what? One, two, three. Okay. Okay. We should get a what? I think it moved a whole bunch. Well, you see, now we can go like this. Okay. We went this way. And literally, do that to line it back up. And this side, over here, the whole thing's got to go this way. That's not bad. Surprisingly easy to move sitting on the ground. Well, I put it in from the end so I don't split it. Yeah. And then every nail I put in, I reverse the angle. Mm -hmm. How far apart? No. Maybe a foot, a little more than a foot. It depends on whether this needs to be pulled down and held. You see, if I do that, you can see it go down. And we want it as tight as we can get it to the fabric so when we put the glue on, it doesn't go inside and glue it in place. But I usually do each end first, and then, because, uh, you know, that's just a trial. That's just a trial. Then I go along and check it, and if the middle is out a little bit, then I knock that in. In this case here, this is pretty good. It's just about where it belongs. All right, that's out a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll make a little bit of an adjustment this way. So now I might put one a little further away, maybe this far away. In a regular reservoir, this bevel would be half that size. So you'd have to put this nail in so that when the fabric comes up, it doesn't hit it. And when it's narrower, then you have to be really careful. Otherwise, your fabric will get interfering with the nail. So this one I'm going to do this way. And when I'm putting that in, I hold this down. So 
I don't use the nail to hold it down. Okay, so I'll put the next one the other way. So this one's going to go the same way. usually needs a little bit of liquid in it because it doesn't have to be strength. But this is a good size to hang on to. It's got some weight to it. So when you put it down, it's not going to easily move. This glue is great because you can paint it on a piece of wood and let it completely dry and then if you have to put them something in a really tight place and like wedge it in and you can't nail it or screw it or anything like that you just re-wet the glue put it in there and clamp it and it's done it's really good and it's uh they call freeze thaw stable it can be frozen and thawed indefinitely without affecting its uh, sticking qualities the process of attaching the bottom rib to the box is exactly the same as to the lid. Glue is applied to the rib and to the rubber cloth, and then it, the rubber cloth is folded onto the rib and held down with tape. This process continued all the way around the reservoir. After that, they measured for the corner gusset pieces and cut those out. We, we made a pattern. We opened the reservoir as wide as it would normally go, high enough so that the, the ribs angle doesn't go further than 90 degrees against itself. If you get it too high, under pressure, if something bad happens to the valve and the safety doesn't work for some reason, it can literally have enough mechanical force on the ribs to blow them right out tear the gussets and, and just blow them right out. And uh, so we try to limit it to no more than 90 degrees um, from rib to rib and for safety. And we usually set the reservoir below that. So when we made the patterns, we had the reservoir up to its max and we used paper and did a pattern based on the actual uh, outline that we did on the woodwork so that the leather when it's cut is essentially a little bit over that line after we skive it and uh, so we then copied the paper pattern that we we adjusted we had to do a couple of different tries um, but we uh, made that into a cardboard stiff pattern so that we could you know do layouts on the leather and things and this is one trick that i do i do that there's my pattern now if i want to put one here this is just i haven't uh, haven't figured that out yet you see, there's that one. Then we can tuck one in maybe over here. You know where you're laying it out, because sometimes you have a piece of leather where there are defects you have to avoid, or you have to do it this way because it isn't wide enough to do long ones. Like here, there's the end of that pattern. See, I can't get another one in that way. But I might do the next one this way and try to conserve as much leather without being crazy, but make sure that you're not wasting it either. It's yeah. a really cool trick that he does where he insets into the pattern so that way whenever he's tracing this that there's a place for the pencil to go in because we need the center points eventually to go into yeah. the, the And we, we need to cut um, a knife cut. In this particular case, the leather as it exists after we do this knife cut is going to butt right up to the edges of the outer leather hinge on the ribs 
and um, that makes it so it's a nice smooth transition without having extra thickness of leather in that area which puts a lot of force on the hinging but by doing this um, which is this way because we made the pattern so this is the top so when we cut the leather so we're cutting from the back we turn the pattern over and we do it the other way so that the finished side of the leather that's going to be up will be the same side as it is representative by the pattern and when that's all on then we put the the corner caps and the inside what I call darts at the inner point to cover any other holes that might be at, at the point where this finishes up but uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell yeah because we took the time to measure these when we had them laid out so the spacing all the way around is the same mm -hmm. and it, it saves you for having to make a pattern for every single gusset hole you know but this is a, a, a good working size so and there's a little extra width in it, so when we skive it, we're going to lose a little bit of the width. But this is very tough it's still leather. still stretchy, though. Yeah, you see, this is still stretchy. And um, this is heavy. And, and the leather that goes on here that's like this is medium. So this, this is tougher because it's completely in the open. This leather is covered on one side with glue, so it'll last fairly long. One, two, three. Yep. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Yep. Okay. You ready? One, yep. two, three. Down. Well, you're going to put it up on one block? So. Yeah. Okay. I said all, right. all the way down. Yeah, well, I've, what I'm thinking is that, see, that's plenty that's of room enough. to work, but it might be nice. Just wants to put it all the way down before we put everything else on. Well, then let's do that. Well, ready? One, two, three. Okay. And again, the other side. Oh, wow, look at how far down that is. It didn't do that when we got it. Well, it never went down this far. Okay. Oh, I still got it up. I was going to say, what the heck? No, <laughs> it, it, I didn't move it far enough. Okay. okay. I heard a little bit of something I don't like. Okay. Yeah, now we should check that bottom hinge all the way around. Because this is where it's going to sit when it's deflated. That might be the reason. The side that's going to get glued is is uh, down. Is down, and it's catching all of the schmutz. Doesn't matter. You're going to glue the schmutz in place. Oh lord. <laughs> Do you see this big section where I didn't get a chance to clean? No. You don't see that? No. See that whole section you where don't. it's not clean. Chris, <laughs> stop glowing. That's what I'm talking about. Don't dragon dragon the small stuff. You're dragging dust through it and jerk. And hey, we'll just call that a glue binder. <laughs> now the final strips of leather were attached to the reservoir, covering the entire lower hinge. And now the project is complete, and the reservoir functions just like it did 130 years ago, maybe even better. Thank you for watching this entire video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know that as long as it is, it's still not completely thorough. There are some steps that we glossed over, but I hope you understand what a gigantic undertaking this was for just two people. And here's something else. There's a ton of footage that we didn't use in either video. Either it was uh, not part of their process or just wasn't a necessary part of telling the story of re-leathering this gigantic reservoir. 
As a bonus to the 2021 Oregon Media Foundation sponsors, we're putting almost all of that extra footage into a third video that will be available just to them. If you're a sponsor of the Oregon Media Foundation this year, look for an email with a link, or if you don't see it, send an email to brent at oregonmedia.org to request it. If you would like to be a sponsor, both to support what we do and to get a look at a process like removing the 1890 feeder pump handle connections without damaging the pedal trackers, uh, you can do that by going to oregon.media and clicking on support. You can become a sponsor of the Oregon Media Foundation starting at just $1. I will also include the entire interview I did with Chris and Nick as they discussed not only the things you saw here, but a number of other things. That whole interview is about 37 minutes long. We'll send out a link to anyone who becomes a sponsor in 2021. Again, that's Oregon.media and click on support. I'll put a link in the description. Thank you for watching. I have actual plans to be on the road again soon, making more videos, so remember to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell to receive updates when new videos are out. You can also find the Oregon Media Foundation on Facebook, Twitter, and we even have an Instagram account for some reason. And you can also find streaming classical organ music on our three stations 24 hours a day, OregonLive.com, Positively Broke, and The Oregon Experience, all of which have new SSL streams for being compatible with the most modern browsers. Thank you for watching this video. I'm Brent Johnson. I'll talk to you next time.